welcome to Who's Who in the Bible, Praying with Biblical Characters. This evening, we will turn to less known characters, Herod Agrippa I and II, yet important ones because the condition of the early church was troubled on their account. St. James, the son of Zebedee, was killed by one, and St. Paul explained his Christian hope before another. Help us, Lord, to appreciate how you steered the church during those troubled times and to trust your guidance in the present time. Amen. Outline for study. Who was Agrippa I? King Agrippa I, his title, the Great King. The Great King, the prohibition of oaths by Jesus, the third temptation of Jesus, a reminder how Herod Agrippa I won the favor of Emperor Caligula, Agrippa and the Christians, the beheading of St. James, the son of Zebedee, and the arrest of St. Peter, the sudden death of Herod Agrippa I, the divine reversal, the successor, King Agrippa II, meeting St. Paul, finally the conclusion. Who was Herod the first? Agrippa the first. Herod Agrippa the first from about 10 BC to 44 AD was the grandson of Herod the Great and Maria Mene the first, a Hasmonean princess. As a child, Agrippa was raised in Rome where he received a Roman education. Here in Rome, he became friends with the future emperor Gaius Caligula and Claudius. As a young man, Agrippa I, the brother of Herodias, was extravagant and in immense debt to luxurious living. In 36 AD, Agrippa made an intemperate remark about Emperor Tiberius. It was overheard by a servant which landed Agrippa in prison. However, Caligula remained his friend. Within a year, Tiberius was dead, and Agrippa's fortunes were reversed. Agrippa gave him the tetrarchy of his uncle Philip, who had died a few years earlier. Agrippa was responsible for the exile of his uncle Herod Antipas, whom Agrippa's sister Herodias had married in a second marriage. After Caligula was murdered, Agrippa had some role to play in ensuring Claudius became emperor. Emperor Claudius rewarded Herod Agrippa by adding territories of Judea and Samaria to his realm. In fact, Herod Agrippa now ruled a kingdom larger than that of his grandfather Herod the Great had been. Herod Agrippa, however, was more Hellenistic than Jewish as a ruler. He built theaters, amphitheaters, baths, porticos, but he gained the support of pious Jews by starting a systematic persecution of Christians, the extent of which we shall observe shortly. King Agrippa I, his title, the Great King. Josephus the historian tells us how the emperor treated Agrippa he, Gaius Caligula, put a diadem on his head and appointed him king of the Tetrarchy of Philip. Agrippa also received the Tetrarchy of Licinius and the honorary title of Praetor. This move would have greatly humiliated his uncle Herod Antipas, who had been only a Tetrarch. Soon, the year following, 38 AD, it is striking that Agrippa became the first Palestinian client king under Roman rule to mint coins that combined his own image, died him like a king, with the title king before his name. It appears that not even Herod the Great, his gr grandfather, who seems to have violated the prohibition against images and may have had himself celebrated as a god, had taken that step. It is therefore not surprising that for the first time a Palestinian king, 
uses the title Basileus Megas before a great king, and he does so as a Roman client king. The title is often coupled with Philo Kaiser, friend of Caesar. Even when he removed his image from coins in circulation in Jerusalem in view of prohibition against images according to Exodus 24, he replaced it with a corresponding royal symbol, the parasol, which adopted, also adopted by Roman emperors in this period. That Agrippa did this appears to receive further support from Josephus, who, when he mentions Agrippa I, refers to him as the great king, to Megalu Basileus. The reason why we dwell on this issue is that Agrippa was a client great king of Palestine in the early years of the Christian movement. The great king, the prohibition of oaths by Jesus. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus asks his disciples not to take oaths. Among the oaths, Jesus cautions them about is the following one. Let me read for you from Matthew 5, 34 to 35. But I say to you, do not take an oath at all, either by heaven, for it is the throne of God, or by the earth, for it is its footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. In the context of the expression city of the great king, is, there is a clear reference to God. To be sure, the great king Agrippa will rule Palestine only eight to ten years after the death of Jesus. But Matthew, writing his gospel later in the 80s, is aware only too well how heedless Agrippa had been in calling himself the great king. Here, two aspects come into play. First, what the title great king actually implies. According to Edwin Robert Bevan, a historian of comparative religion, when Agrippa considered himself a great king, he did not mean the great in a historical sense, like Herod the Great, his own grandfather. Rather, the title referred to the aspect of his superiority over other lesser monarchs who in the Eastern world had received only the title king and not great king. Second, Agrippa was great king not of any place, but of Palestine, of Jerusalem, the city of the great king, God himself. For the Jew and Christian alike, how could any human king dare call himself a great king of a city that belongs to God? To underline this, Jesus had already told his disciples not to take an oath by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king, God himself. Dennis C. During, emeritus professor and a fellow of the University of Chicago, believes the prohibition of this oath, as it comes to us from Matthew, was in view of King Agrippa usurping the right of God over Jerusalem. We do not know if some Christians did in fact take oaths by Jerusalem. But the command not to swear oaths by Jerusalem was perhaps a covert Christian allusion to a monarch who persecuted early Christian leaders, as we will soon observe. The third temptation of Jesus, a reminder how Herod Agrippa I won the favor of Emperor Caligula. In the third temptation of Jesus on the mountain top, Satan assumes a fundamentally different strategy. In the first two, the wilderness and the temple scenes, the challenge to turn stone to bread and to throw himself down the pinnacle of the temple were direct challenges to Jesus' divine sonship and exercise thereof, with an implied incitement to disobey God through abuse of his power as God's son. On the mountaintop, in the third temptation, however, the incitement to apostasy is overt, 
open and the challenge to Jesus divine sonship is implicit in the temptation to obtain power other than from God let me read for you Matthew 4 8 to 9 again the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory and he said to him all these I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. Jared Tyson, professor of New Testament theology at the University of Heidelberg, has argued that the temptation narrative, and in particular the episode on the mountaintop in Matthew, reflects the reign of Caligula from 37 to 41 AD. Why? Because in 40 AD, about 8 to 10 years after the death of Jesus, the Jewish people in Palestine had been confronted with the prospect of idolatrous worship of the emperor when Caligula decreed that his statue be erected in the temple in Jerusalem, for he had dominion over all the kingdoms of the world. St. Matthew Reflecting on the motive of prostration before an earthly ruler who called himself God with the power and the disposition to bestow kingdoms clearly reflects a Roman emperor and none better than Caligula. He bestowed on Agrippa kingdom after kingdom. First, those of his uncle Philip, next that of Licinius, and thereafter also of his uncle and brother-in-law Herod Antipas, whom he had discredited before the Emperor Caligula. Later, Claudius confirmed Agrippa in his territories and added to them Judea, Samaria, and Idumea, together with jurisdiction over the temple and the right of nomination to the high priesthood. At the same time, the Senate bestowed consular rank on Agrippa, so that Agrippa was in control of more kingdoms than ever, than even his grandfather Herod the Great had governed. Jared Thyssen accordingly argues that Caligula serves as the model for Satan in this third temptation scene. While Agrippa obtained his kingdom through subservience to Caligula, the personification of Satan Jesus had refused to submit to Satan and had rejected the reward of temporal power and kingship. Agrippa is the antitype of Jesus. Whereas Jesus was condemned by the Jewish hierarchy, executed by the Romans and exalted by God, Agrippa was revered by the Jewish people, crowned by the Romans and would be destroyed by God. N. H. Taylor, a scholar well-versed in the subject of Palestinian Christianity and the Caligula crisis, now stationed in Zimbabwe, has argued that the story of the temptation of Jesus on the mountaintop is a polemic not so much against Caligula as against the Herodian client king Agrippa I because he obtained much of his power and territory through indulgence of a self-deified emperor. The temptation with which Jesus is confronted in Matthew chapter 4 verse 8 and Luke chapter 4 verse 5 is precisely to obtain earthly dominion through homage to Satan. Thaisen, therefore, has correctly identified Caligula as the model for Satan. But how does Satan engage Jesus? Not as an equal dialogue partner, but as a prospective patron. Satan is the one who is going to confer the kingdoms. The antitype of Jesus is, therefore, not Satan, but the one who, unlike Jesus, accepts Satan's patronage and the power and the territory that is the reward of homage to Satan. This role, Taylor argues, is filled from a Palestinian Christian point of view by Agrippa I. He appears in Acts under the family name Herod as the persecutor of the Jerusalem church and dies subsequently as a consequence of accepting idolatrous worship Acts chapter 12. 
while the situation precipitated by Caligula lies in the background, it is specifically the actions of Agrippa that are connected to the temptation on the mountaintop. Jesus was tempted by Satan, but he did not give in to Satan. But Agrippa did to Caligula, the emissary of Satan. Agrippa and the Christians. The beheading of St. James, the son of Zebedee, and the arrest of St. Peter. In the year 40 AD, when Caligula ordered a statue set up in the temple of Jerusalem, Josephus tells us that many tens of thousands of Jews went down to Ptolemaeus to beseech Petronius, the Roman governor, not to carry out the order. And that many myriads protested to him again at Tiberius, offering to let him kill them and refusing to cultivate their fields. The gravity of the situation caused Petronius to delay, and fortunately for him and for the Jews, Caligula was murdered on 24th of January in 41 AD, before the statue was ready to set up. With the accession of Emperor Claudius as the fourth emperor of Rome, almost immediately upon the assassination of Caligula, Agrippa's immediate task was to restore order. Both Agrippa and Claudius hoped eventually to achieve a permanent settlement in Palestine by a more sympathetic treatment of the Jews. According to a noted New Testament scholar, Joseph Ward Swain of the University of Illinois, it was necessary for Agrippa to convince the Romans that he was acting energetically to restore order. Those in open rebellion and those announcing the immediate appearance of the Messiah had to be silenced at once. However, he had no desire to begin his reign by slaughtering a number of Jewish national heroes. Since the Christians were unpopular anyhow, his obvious course was to arrest and execute a few of them as rebels and report his accomplishments boastfully to Rome. The Christians therefore suffered. Let me read for you from Acts 12, 1 to 4. About that time, Herod the Great, Herod the King, laid violent hands on some who belonged to the church. He killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. And when he saw that it pleased the Jews, he proceeded to arrest Peter also. This was during the days of the unleavened bread. And when he had seized him, he put him in prison, delivering him over to four squads of soldiers to guard him, intending after the Passover to bring him out to the people. So Peter was kept in prison, but earnest prayer for him was made to God by the church. Most likely, Agrippa's steps against the Christians were taken as early as 41 AD. St. James, the son of Zebedee, the brother of John, may well have been executed within the first weeks of Agrippa's arrival in Palestine. Though Peter remained in custody, his execution was delayed until after the Passover of 42 AD. And during this delay, the angel helped him to escape. The Passover was apt to be a period of religious and nationalistic excitement and Agrippa apparently feared trouble if he executed Peter, even though the Jews had shown pleasure at the execution of James. Perhaps not all Jews shared the same sentiments. The pro-Roman aristocrats may have been pleased while the populace was not. It is unlikely that Agrippa had learnt the true feelings of the people who resented having anybody at all executed by the Romans or their agents. What do we find? What, what, what we do find is that after the execution of James and the arrest of Peter, 
there is a second wave of Christian growth in the days of Agrippa. Just as there had been the first great expansion following the persecution culminating in the death of Stephen. Christian expansion now took on renewed vigor. It is true, but the failure of the Messiah to appear in his second coming at this time brought the collapse of their early dream. They now became convinced that Christ must first be proclaimed throughout the world before they could expect his second coming. The sudden death of Herod Agrippa I, the divine reversal. Agrippa put the sentries of the prison to death for letting Peter escape. Then he went down from Judea to Caesarea and spent time there. It is here in Caesarea that Herod Agrippa I met with a sudden death in 44 AD. Luke appears to dwell on a theme that is quite familiar to us, the divine reversal. The action of Herod Antipas in beheading John the Baptist foreshadows Herod Agrippa's murder of James. As Herod Antipas and Herodias disappeared into oblivion, the crimes by Herod Agrippa against God's people will lead to his death. In the Gospel, Luke presents Herod Antipas mocking Jesus by arraying him with a splendid clothing. In Acts, however, there is a dramatic reversal in the dawning of Herod Agrippa in royal robes. In Luke, Jesus was declared innocent, but in Acts, Herod Agrippa will meet his death. What exactly happened? Let me read for you from Acts 12, 20 to 24. Now Herod was angry with the people of Tyre and Sidon. And they came to him with one accord, and having persuaded Blastus, the king's chamberlain, they asked for peace, because their country depended on the king's country for food. On an appointed day, Herod put on his royal robes, took his seat upon the throne, and delivered an oration to them. And the people were shouting, The voice of a God, not of a man. Immediately an angel of the Lord struck him down, because he did not give God the glory. And he was eaten by worms and breathed his last. But the word of God increased and multiplied. The account of Herod's death in Acts bears the conventional, conventional elements of a death of a tyrant type scene as illustrated by O. Wesley Allen and Stephen Mead, both New Testament scholars. We shall underline some important elements of death of a tyrant type scene. According to the account in Acts, Herod's speech is acknowledged by the people as the voice of a God and not of a man. But in Josephus' account, Agrippa appears on the second day of a great festival wearing a garment completely woven of silver. In fact, in this account, it is Herod's glimmering garb that prompts the crowd to praise Herod inappropriately as divine. When the sun reflected on the garment, those in awe of the sight immediately addressed him as a god. An important element in the death of a tyrant-type scene is the offense Agrippa committed. What was the offense? Agrippa had inappropriately usurped glory that was due to God alone. We are told that he did not give God the glory, 1223. This is followed by a speedy and a decisive punishment which Herod receives. The punishment is perhaps the most memorable detail in the text. Not only is Herod struck down by the angel of the Lord, but he is also eaten by worms and thus breathes his last. Next is attribution. We are left in no doubt to whom the act of judgment should be attributed. It is the angel of the Lord who acts not of its own accord, but as an agent of God. Finally, we have the result. 
At this point, all other characters have fallen from view. But the word of God increased and multiplied, 1224. The death of Herod Agrippa is meant to tell us that nothing can stop God's word from advancing. The death of Herod's story remains instructive for all people today as a challenge and testament to the faithfulness and the might of God as a warning against the excessive self-confidence and arrogance of Herod. We now come to his successor, King Agrippa II, and his meeting St. Paul. After the death of Herod Agrippa I in 44 AD, Emperor Claudius re-annexed the whole of Judea and Samaria, plus the former tetrarchies of Philip, Licinius, and Antipas back to Rome. Herod's son, the future Agrippa II, was only 17 years old then. When he did come to rule eventually, he ruled a client kingdom of the Roman Empire to the northeast of the Roman governor Festus's province. Agrippa II is important because he is the one who will cross-examine St. Paul. Let us read Acts 25 verse 13 to 14, 24 to 25. Now when some days had passed, Agrippa the king and Bernice arrived at Caesarea and greeted Festus. And as they stayed there for many days, Festus laid Paul's case before the king and said, There is a man left prisoner by Felix. And when I was at Jerusalem, the chief priests and the elders of the Jews laid out their case against him, asking for a sentence of condemnation against him. And Festus said, King Agrippa and all who are present with us, you see this man about whom the whole Jewish people petitioned me, both in Jerusalem and here, shouting out that he ought not to live any longer. But I found that he had done nothing deserving death. And as he himself appealed to the emperor, I decided to go ahead and send him. Agrippa II was known as an expert in Jewish customs and religious matters. Though he did not have jurisdiction over Paul in this case, his hearing of the matter would be help, helpful for Festus. Concerning King Agrippa II, his great-grandfather Herod the Great had tried to kill Jesus as a baby. His grandfather Antipas had John the Baptist beheaded. His father Agrippa I had martyred James, the son of Zebedee, the first apostle to be killed. Now Paul stood before the next in line of the Herods, Herod Agrippa II. St. Paul appears before Agrippa in Acts chapter 26. We then hear St. Paul telling Agrippa why he is accused by the Jews. Acts 26, 6 to 8. And now I stand here on trial because of my hope in the promise made by God to our fathers, to which our 12 tribes hope to attain as they earnestly worship night and day. And for this hope, I am accused by Jews, O King. Why is it thought incredible by any of you that God raises the dead? St. Paul then continues with the story of his conversion. Having heard Paul, we have King Agrippa telling Paul in Acts 26, 28 to 32, in a short time, would you persuade me to be a Christian? And Paul said, whether short or long, I would to God that not only you, but also all who hear me this day might become such as I am, except for these chains. Then the king rose and the governor and Bernice and those who were sitting with them. And when they had withdrawn, they said to one another, This man is doing nothing 
to deserve death or imprisonment. And Agrippa said to Festus, this man could have been set free if he had not appealed to Caesar. Agrippa appears to have been indifferent, actually, to the spread of Christianity during his rule. A Byzantine scholar, Porcius, informs us that he had read that Agrippa died in the third year of Emperor, Roman Emperor Trajan, about the year 100. He was the last of the Herods. He appears not to have left any family behind. Let us now conclude, dear friends. What did the dynasty of Herod really achieve, having ruled Judea for about a hundred years? They brought to the land stability and wealth, but not peace. They ruled for Rome. They could not stop the destruction of Jerusalem. In addition to this ultimate political failure, the Herods scandalized many of their subjects by their Hellenist and Roman sympathies and the immorality of their personal lives. As a result, the name of Herod came to be reviled by pious Jews and later by Christians as well. What do we learn from this episode? Herod is always with us, teaching us to bend our knees before insolent might. But we need not. But we have lost sight of this truth. We think somehow that through power, through law, or the right kind of politics, we can make the world into a good place. Columnist John Garvey of the Commonweal has said, the world can be brought into a marginally better condition through political means but there will always be a Herodian edge to our use of politics and force. In doing this, we will become subservient to the evil one. Since the early Christians at first expected Christ to come soon, they accepted suffering and persecution as the matrix within which Christ's second coming would be revealed. But soon the Christians learned that Christ will not come until the gospel is first preached to all the nations. In the meantime, Herod is in charge to one degree or another, teaching us to pay homage to power. Help us, dear Lord, to know that your Holy Spirit reigns ever supreme and that he can lead us forward so that we confidently speak truth to power as we wait for Christ to come again. Amen. The Lord be with you. May Almighty God bless you, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Thank you, dear friends, for your presence this evening. Have a wonderful evening. Good night.